Hello, this is Dr. Ford Brewer with PrevMed, Heart Attack, Stroke, Cancer Prevention. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about glucose tolerance testing at McDonald's or Hardee's or uh, 7-Eleven. I'm talking about sodas, soft drinks. <clears throat> What's so bad about them? Are they really as bad as um, they say they are? The answer is yes, they are very bad. They're pure glucose, they're sugar and water um, in a carbonated form, so it actually hurts your teeth as well as your body. Um, in fact, I'm going to start off by talking about a glucose tolerance test. It's a medical test that we used to be very popular. It's not so popular anymore, but it's still the gold standard for being able to measure a patient's ability to metabolize and ingest uh, carbohydrates. Liquid carbohydrates are the toughest challenge on our endocrine system. Before we do though, let's just review quickly the hormonal obesity theory. So basically what you'll usually hear is that insulin uh, increases as it does, it shuts off fat burning. If you read Gary Taub's Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, uh, Bernstein, some of the other books, that's what they talk about. And of course, they're saying the insulin is being stimulated by um, ingesting carbohydrates. Again, the biggest challenge is uh, colas, sodas, soft drinks. There may be a little bit more to it than just insulin. Uh, when you start looking at other things like ghrelin, the hunger hormone, or the um, adrenal hormones, uh, DHEA, dihydroepiandosterone, cortisol. Um, you do a glucose tolerance challenge, and three and four hours later, you get the hunger hormone skyrocketing, uh, the adrenal hormones skyrocketing. With a protein challenge, though, stays stable. You don't get that increase. You don't get that endocrine, that massive endocrine response to proteins and fats when you ingest them in a meal. So the reality of the, um, the hormonal uh, theory, the hormonal uh, concepts behind obesity and weight gain is probably more like this. High insulin, cortisol, ghrelin, the hunger hormone, and DHEA, the other adrenal hormone, drives obesity. Um, <clears throat> now let's go back and talk just briefly about um, oral glucose tolerance tests, why it's important, what it tells us, and then we'll talk about the glucose tolerance challenges we're getting at McDonald's with soft drinks. Um, here's the glucose tolerance curve for a, a diabetic. Here's one for a uh, someone with pristine um, glucose metabolism or carbohydrate metabolism. First of all, what are we doing here? The patient went for with no carbs, no calories for eight hours, nothing by mouth. Then we gave them 75 grams of sugar in a sugar water uh, uh, solution, usually called glucola, 75 grams sugar in water. The, uh, the person with great sugar metabolism will peak at about one hour at 120 and then get back down to about 90, right below 100. Full-blown diabetic may start up at 140 or more. Within two hours, they're still up at 200. And then the two-hour number is very important because it gives us what we expect to have in terms of glucose levels. And you see a very slow glide path back down for the diabetic. Now, for those of us over 60 years of, old, of age, and even over 50, most of us over 60 and a lot of us over 50, we're not down here anymore. We're not quite up here. We're somewhere in between. And that is what we call insulin resistance. Now, again, to look at that on a day-by-day, hour-by-hour basis, this is why it begin, begins to be so important, especially that two-hour glucose uh, reading. A, someone with perfect uh, glucose metabolism is going to average a little bit below 100. 
Someone with diabetes, full-blown diabetes, can average over 150 during the day. This is their number, this top curve. And again, the insulin-resistant curve is down here. There's plenty of evidence, although it's not totally proven what level of glucose um, is, starts burning tissue. I think the, the reality is that the more glucose you have in your blood, the more it's burning tissue or the more it's um, glycosylating your proteins. Glycosylated proteins in the arteries of the, uh, the walls of the artery uh, cause inflammation. LDL can no longer pass through and it just forms plaque and then plaque forms inflammation. Let's get biochemical real quick in terms of looking at colas, sodas. On the label, they'll usually say high fructose corn syrup, but all, often they're a mixture of these three. Glucose, which we have in the glucola, uh, oral glucose challenge. Fructose, which you see in corn. Um, and a combination of the two. If you look at these, this is glucose. And this is fructose. You hook them together with an oxygen uh, atom in there, and they form sucrose. Now, for those of us who uh, are starting to think about this and say, well, what about, you know, they say that uh, grains are like sugars, starches, uh, they're polysaccharides. Well, here's a starch, and yes, it is. It's actually just these sugar molecules hooked together one by one by one in a long chain, and then you can even have branch chains. So when you eat pastry, if you eat bread, even though it may not taste sweet, this is what you're getting, starches. And the easily digested starches, our body takes, turns from them from this into this in minutes. So remember, we started off talking about uh, the good old soft drink. Are soft drinks really that bad? Coke versus Pepsi, the great cola wars. Um, yes, they are that bad. Uh, they're, as I said earlier, they're like a glucose tolerance challenge. And a gl glucose tolerance challenge is not something I'd want to do to my pancreas every day. But guess what? <clears throat> Many of us are doing this to our pancreas more than once a day, every day, for decades. What are the ingredients in a, in a soda? Well, carbonated water. So it's water with sugar. And again, just the carbonation makes it tougher on teeth. Well, how many, so it's water and sugar. How much sugar in it? 41 grams. And that's in a third of a liter, 355 milliliters. So a third of a liter, that's a, isn't that a fairly small uh, soda or Coke? Um, yeah. If you look at a, a McDonald's, I looked this up on the McDonald's site. They said a large Coke is 32 ounces or almost a liter. Whoa, that's a lot of sugar. That's more than a glucose tolerance test. Here's another way of looking at it. Um, they tell me in another area on, this, uh, on the website that it's 77 grams of sugar. You remember how much sugar we had in a... Glucose tolerance test, 75. But again, a large Coke at McDonald's is maybe really not that big. When you look at it uh, compared to what you can get on the, in the retail market, it was a lot smaller back in 1950. It was a paltry seven ounces. That was a large Coke at McDonald's. By 1980, though, they started to get the message and competitors were coming in, like 7-Eleven with a big gulp. The uh, large Coke at McDonald's at that point was 21 ounces, 32 ounces in 1990. And the big gulp at 7-Eleven is 40 ounces, 1990. Well, the big gulp got bigger. I guess there were a lot of people that were really thirsty out there and really wanted a lot of sugar. 64 ounces in the double big gulp or the double gulp. It's like... And I'm assuming this bucket gulp is a joke, but heck, you know what? That's a joke. That's a bad joke. It's a dangerous joke. It's a sugar bomb. 
if you go back to the original image, we're talking about sugar bombs here. These things are not good for you. Now, 40 ounces or 64 ounces. Um, how many ounces in a small one? Gosh, you know, I, I'm not even going to calculate it. I, We're talking about multiple glucose tolerance challenges in one meal. <clears throat> so are we safer going back to orange juice? Unfortunately, no. Um, orange juice is a, it's got some other things in it, but it's primarily uh, fructose, which is the fruit sugar in water. So what does that say about those of us who uh, who grew up eating cereal and uh, orange juice, <clears throat> they used to say, well, you know, you get a healthy cereal like Special K and orange juice, that is a great breakfast for a diet. Well, you know what? That's a great breakfast to wreck your pancreas. Uh, it's a great breakfast for getting obese. And so we're asking ourselves, after that, as a diet, weight loss technique for the past, that was an ad, by the way, from 1942, for the past seven decades. After that, as our version of dieting for breakfast, we're wondering why we have an obesity epidemic. Thank you.